Good morning. You sprung forward. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Opening words this morning are informed by Leonard Mason. Let us confirm the unfailing renewal of life, rising from the earth and reaching for the sun. All living creatures can fulfill themselves. Let us affirm the steady growth of human companionship, rising from ancient cradles and reaching for the stars. People the world over seek ways of understanding. Let us confirm our continuing hope that our coming together inspires vision, deepens companionship, challenges complacency, and makes way for joy. It's good to be together. Let's sing together hymn number one in the gray hymnal, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. Please rise as you are able in body and spirit. Good morning. Welcome to First Parish in Milton. My name is Dottie Pitt, and I'm a member of our worship committee. If you're having any trouble hearing us in the sanctuary or on Zoom, please raise your hand here in the sanctuary or put something into the chat function. Welcome to everybody. We're so glad you've chosen to be here this morning with us, virtually or in person. However your journey, whatever your heritage and whomever you love, you are welcome here. Your presence here on Sunday morning enriches worship for everyone. This sanctuary is made holy by your presence. If you are joining us for the first time, a special welcome. You will find information about First Parish in your pew, or one of the greeters or I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. And we would welcome the opportunity to walk with you to social hour, which I believe this morning is being put on by our religious exploration students after the service. The work of living our faith is done both in and out of worship, so I call your attention to the pr printed announcements that came in your order of worship or are found in the emailed link. In particular, there are two items of special note for next Sunday, March 19th. Milton Community Concerts presents its next concert a week from today at 3 o'clock. It sounds like it's going to be really cool. It's called Tunes and Tosses. Put your imagination going there. It's an afternoon with virtuoso musician and juggler Stuart Ryersey. You may remember he's been here before playing the piano. He's amazing. But he also apparently juggles. This program will feature classical, folk, and Celtic music, as well as some dazzling displays of artistic juggling. Tickets are free for students 18 and under. 
$10 for seniors, and $20 for general admission. And also next week is Commitment Sunday. Gratefully, I'm going to be surprised. Um, <laughs> where we celebrate our future and share gratitude for all those involved with First Parish at, at the present time. The service will be followed by a gratitude gathering brunch. As we enter into worship, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Now let's take a few minutes to greet one another and extend a warm welcome to old friends and new, staying in our seats. We're still, even though we're on the low end, we're still in COVID, being COVID safe. And for those of you on Zoom, Please turn on your um, gallery view so you can say hello to others who are zooming in. Zooming in. Go for it. Greet each other. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hey, Carl. Hey, Diana. Hey, How Trace. Good morning. Hi, is Sandra there? And okay. there's some people here. There we go. Um, Carl, hey, let me know. Good hey, morning. Tracy. Hi, Hal. Hey, Cynthia. Hi, Good morning, Diana. everybody. Hi, hey. Hal. Hey, everybody. Back. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. We're on for chat later if you want to stay on for chat. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Marco, Good morning. if you're there. Social group this morning. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite Gabby up to help me light the chalice. See Gabby, you later. You join me. <laughs> yeah. Each Sunday, we light the chalice as a reminder that hope, love, and faith still abide. A corner of warmth and awareness where we, the members of First Parish Faith Community, can find comfort, connection, and support with one another. join in saying our call to worship. We gather to celebrate the sacred within and among us. We come to seek spiritual hope and understanding. We strive to practice acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Together, we work to build a world with justice and compassion. Come, let us gather together. So I'm asking Dottie to stay up with me because I wanted us to think about and demonstrate together a concept called push hands. Are there very many people here that know that concept? It comes from martial arts. I am not a martial art teacher, but it can also be used sometimes in theater games too, in ways, and it's basically a way to um, be in relationship with each other's energy, with each other's energy in order to create balance or understand balance enough in martial arts to throw people off balance. We're not gonna do that today. <laughs> We're gonna look for balance. But anyway, so what it is is you um, ha and have a good stance of some sort. Often it's, uh, it can either be parallel or like this, yeah. And then put up a hand. And you just sort of check out with each other your strength with one another, just gently. And we see, and sometimes a person like I can push Dottie until she might start pushing back. And that says to me that she, you know, she doesn't want to go any more further. Now, um, or she may push hard and say in martial arts, I would let go of that. And she might go, wah, but that we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically communicating with one another about the energy of your being, right? And it's good to have a stance where you're sort of strong here, and then once you get comfortable with another, you can kind of play. And this is more the, the theater thing. <laughs> you know, you could just play with how you can relate to one another. Thank you. Very good. Wonderful. So are there a few people that would like to do that? Come on up. Come on up. Come do some push hands. 
Okay. Do we have another person about Grace's height that would do it with us? Where's Leslie? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll try and do it with you. Okay, Grace? So what you do is you put up a hand, whichever hand you'd like that you're comfortable with. Okay, I'm going to do the opposite hand. You put up the opposite hand. Right. And at first, just look in each other's eyes and do a slight little bow so that you say, I see you. I see you. And then go ahead and push so that I can get a feeling, so that you can have a feeling, ooh, of how strong you are, Miss Grace. And then I might push back, and you don't want me to push back, so that's fine. And then try to yield, try to let me push back so you can feel a little bit about my energy, my movement. And this is a lot about what it's like in relationship, right? Although we use words a lot. Sometimes we say something to someone else to see how it's going to land, to see what the other person is doing. And sometimes the person pushes back. You want to push me? Just keep pushing until... Nice until you, right. And then sometimes people will just stay with. And sometimes we explore together with our same energies. So we want to explore sort of moving our hands together. Nice, nicely done. Nice. I'm moving your hand? Is that what it feels like? Okay, let's try and do it so that we're both moving somehow. After a while, you can get what's called kind of a symbiosis where you don't know who is leading. Isn't that cool? And have you ever had conversations like that where they just kind of flow? <laughs> Wonderful work. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So there's lots about us. We have energy, we have communication that we don't always pay attention to. And we have a way to be in balance with one another. But that means that we have to do a little push and pull. And we have to be willing to find the place of steadiness. So that's a bit. We're talking about <coughs> relationships today. A lot about relationships not being balanced. And it's something that we all would like to have happen more often. So that's what we'll be talking about in uh, the sanctuary today. So looking very forward to what you are producing for our coffee hour. Feel free to uh, walk to the classes. <coughs> <coughs> Now's a time in our service when we share a time of stillness, where we let the presence of this place and each other fill us, surround us, enfold us, and we rest into our bodies. Something I heard in a workshop yesterday was this wonderful image that I wanted to bring up today. And she said, sometimes people talk about how the lungs massage the heart with breathing. So the sermon today is going to be about domestic violence. I wanted to tell you that now. And um, if that feels at all activating to anyone, I am happy to talk to you afterwards. And also, let's use, let's get another tool of self-calming, like breathing and thinking of your lungs, massaging your heart and saying, it's okay, we have strength. Stillness for a little bit.
The reading this morning is titled For Peace by Irish poet and philosopher John O'Donohue from the book Benedictus. As the fever of day calms toward twilight, may all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their heart glimpse providence at the heart of history. That those who make riches from violence and war might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost. That we might see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression. That those who enjoy the privilege of peace might not forget their tormented brothers and sisters. The wolf might lie down with the lamb that our swords be beaten into plowshares, and no hurt or harm be done anywhere along the holy mountain. That these shoes and this apron that place and its patrons have taken more than I gave them. It's not easy to know I'm not anything like I used to be, although it's true. Was never attention sweet center. I still remember that girl. She's imperfect, but she tries. She is good, but she lies. She Start over and rewrite an 
Last night I heard the screaming, loud voices behind the wall. Another sleepless night for me, it won't do no good to call. The police always come late if they come at all. A song on Tracy Chapman's debut album in 1988 an eerie, pointed a cappella rendering of images and urgency. And when they arrive, she sings on, they say they can't interfere with domestic affairs between a man and his wife. And as they walk out the door, the tears well up in her eyes. In the decades since, there is more understanding about domestic violence in law enforcement. And still, depending on the neighborhood or precinct, the responses are faster and the follow-through is wiser. Understanding is slowly evolving from an assumption of it being a private domestic problem that the couple needs to work out on their own to a realization of a dynamic of malice that calls for intervention. That is, if people are notified. Data from the 2019 National Crime Victimization Survey reveals that only 52%, basically half, of domestic violence incidents are reported to the police. And then there are many who, after reporting, change their minds about prosecution. They either stay or seek help without legal accountability for their abusive partner. Last night I heard the screaming, then a silence that chilled my soul. Prayed that I was dreaming when I saw the ambulance in the road. And the policeman said, I'm here to keep the peace. Will the crowd disperse? I think we all could use some sleep. Statistics from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence reports one in seven women and one in 25 men have been injured by an intimate partner. It's important to recognize that domestic violence can happen to men as well, but far more to women. This points to the fact of an epidemic of violence, not a problem with the nature of women. It's a problem with misogyny for sure, the hatred and fear of women, but not a problem with the nature of women. Femicide, the gender-based killing of women, is prevalent in the United States. Many may assume that it is worse outside the US and also that it's a problem within low-income countries. This could not be further from the truth, reports Sanctuary for Families. Of all femicide cases in high-income countries, 70% occur in the United States. 
70% of the murder of women in high-income con countries occur in the United States. On a global scale, the U.S. ranks 34th for international female homicides. The report further explains that almost three women are killed by an intimate partner every day. 92% were killed by a man they knew, and 63% were killed by current husbands, boyfriends, or ex-husbands. The report concludes that women are being killed because they are women. Deep breath. Lundy Bancroft, renowned author and consultant on domestic abuse and child mal maltreatment, points out that abuse is the product of a mentality that excuses and condones bullying and exploitation, that promotes superiority and disrespect, that casts responsibility on the oppressed, blaming the victim. So how do we approach this pandemic of violence? this permission of malice? How do we, in John O'Donohue's poem for peace, see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression? Well, this is a complex issue that I cannot fully address in this sermon, but I'd like to suggest a few ways to frame this contagion of, contagion of violence, perhaps to see more clearly perhaps to deplete just a bit the pull of malice. It's highly likely that you know someone who has experienced domestic violence. It's not out there, it's everywhere. So I offer three dynamics to consider for deeper awareness and readiness in this culture fatally attracted to aggression. One, is to recognize that malice exists. Two, is to debunk popular myths about domestic violence. And three, to add hope and humility towards those living through the tyranny and the learning and the recovery of domestic violence. One, malice exists. Some might want to call this evil, it's a part of our collective consciousness, honed, deepened, and persisted throughout the millennia, most likely begun with the very few first human fear. How can we tender a consciousness that is ever more aware of the trappings of malice? How do we create an environment where malice does not flourish? For malice is hungry and needs feeding. Since it dwells in our constructed realities, which are formidable and dynamic, we do ourselves a disservice when we think it is not real. It lives and moves and has being, feeding on the impulses of fear, isolation, greed, and pathologies of power. One of the superpowers of malice is that to hide itself, for people to think it doesn't exist. Historically, there is not a lot of emphasis on evil in liberal theology. Unitarian Universalism is an optimistic faith, what William James would name a religion of healthy-mindedness. We tend to emphasize the goodness of God, of each other, or the cosmos, rather than the power of evil to corrupt. James Luther Adams, 20th century theologian and activist, warned Unitarian Universalists about their avoidance of the reality of sin and evil. On the whole, liberals want to be liked, to be open, to be affirming, to be good people. In our culture, that translates to rarely saying no, even when we'd like to, and not to reject others, even though boundaries would be appropriate. He pointed out the overemphasis on freedom, which creates a lack of determination in saying no, in constructing appropriate boundaries and taboos toward that which would harm life. I coin this inefficacy of well-meaning liberals, the inefficacy of well-meaning liberals. 
For example, a domestic violence incident between intimates, what might be thought of by well-meaning liberals, a well-meaning liberal response is, well, there are two sides to every story. We don't really know what's going on behind closed doors. Or, poor guy, he must have lost it. He must have had a terrible childhood with no mention of what just happened to the woman. Or, it's important that the two of them work it out on their own. No. Malice is in the situation, and intervention is needed. This is not demonizing the abuser. It is recognizing the infectious invasion of malice. A quote by Susan Cooper. He was not for that moment a human being, but a frenzied creature possessed by rage, turned into an animal. All that could be seen in him was the urge to hurt, and it was, as it always will be, the most dreadful sight in the world. Malice overtakes. It is not reasonable. Two. Some myths that you may be able to identify all assist the continuation and collusion of violence. I'll just name a few. An eight-year-old comes home from school. Mommy, Johnny pulled my pigtail riding home on the bus and it hurt. Oh, honey, that's just because he likes you. Will Smith, after the famous Oscar slap, came up to the mic with an explanation that easily flowed and has been taught in society as a way to save face. We do crazy things for love. Have you any idea how many women are six feet under with that popular excuse for violence? Passion. Crime of passion. Or the standard assumption, the abuser had a terrible childhood or a trauma that he is working out on his mate. Even if that is true, there are a lot of other ways he can work out his distress. Women are not expendable for a man's health. And why do women stay? Why don't they report abuse more? Why do they pull back from legal accountability toward their partners? Again, countless reasons. A large percentage of women experience domestic violence are in the helping profession, and they are people pleasers. They truly want to help the one they love. They see the suffering. They think their love will heal the situation and stay years and years and years with that thought and hope. No. They may stay for children or for finances or because they have a, no sense of a place to go or they just don't feel like they deserve more. They may feel threatened by malicious reasoning of murder or suicide. They may feel they've made their own bed and must lie in it and begin to not recognize themselves. Each time there's an intimate violation and the woman decides to stay, her self-esteem chips away until the will to claim oneself feels irretrievable. This is a tough ter sermon today, I know. But it's okay. It can be a hopeful one, too, because we can see it. See it. See it and make other choices to heal, to transform. This is not about good folks and bad folks. This is about a dynamic in human consciousness that does not have to overtake us. It is cunning, it is compelling, and it is not how we have to be. Every year, the Parkway Methodist Church leads a town-wide service for domestic violence awareness. I've been asked to offer prayers in years past. Here's one slightly edited for today that I'd like to share with you because we can do this. We can become more aware and less complacent. That's the point of the vigil that United Parkway does every year. And this was for an interfaith gathering. God of all naming, source of life in the deepest reaches of our being. Enfold us with tough and tender love so that we may uphold those who suffer from domestic violence. For intimate partners, 
whose tender trust is devastated unto paralyzing despair, bruised and broken in body and spirit. May they have insight to see the malice that is not theirs to fix. May they break away from the cycle of violence to seek help and come to know the value of their lives. For children who are abused and who witness violence in the home, may defenders be known in their lives to protect them and begin the long healing from harm. For society that colludes or gives up, May we not look away or dismiss or blame those who are violated. May strength and self-claiming be abundant. May courage and help be ever available. May clarity rise to the surface for eyes to see and ears to hear the dignity of life and the distortion of violence. So may it be. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 86, Blessed Spirit of My Life in the Gray Hymnal. Please rise as you are able in body and spirit. Let us gather our hearts in the spirit of prayer. God of all naming, source of all being that flows in rivers and blood, wind and breath, that rests in heart and center to give us guidance and wisdom for these lives that we live. Thank you for this compassionate and caring community, this faith community that reaches out to one another. Help us know what it does for our lives and the ripple out of hope into other lives. May we strengthen ourselves toward deeper knowledge, hear the hard things and the happy things and find ourselves whole with one another. Prayers go out 
for things happening in the world, strifes all over the world, the continued war in Ukraine, violence against women and silence of women in many countries, all countries, in fact. May we pray for clarity and sanity of the preciousness of being, of the gift of life we were born with. And know it is enough, and know we are enough to shift priorities and transform our world. For all the prayers deeply felt but unspoken, let us hold them in love. Amen. Good morning again. I'd like to introduce Marina Beda. She is representing Sunflower of Peace. It is, a, it is a fundraiser that provides medical and humanitarian aid that will be used by the paramedics and doctors in the areas that are affected by the violence in Ukraine. Maria, Marina will come up and speak on the, as the community relations representative and will speak on their behalf. Thanks, Marina. morning and thank you <clears throat> and thank you for letting me speak today on behalf of Sunflower of Peace. My name is Marina Beda and I am volunteer with Sunflower of Peace from 2014. I, I thought that I would never see a war in Ukraine. Ukraine is a very peaceful nation. It has not been a war in Ukraine since World War II. But a year ago, full-scale war started in Ukraine by Russia, and every Ukrainian now is ready to defend their country, freedom, and their dignity. Every day, I'm reading stories about brave Ukrainians, doctors, scientists, lawyers, musicians, students, and farmers. They left their civilian life and their families, and join the military to defend their country from ruthless attack. I also read stories about many heroes who died while defending Ukraine. Flowering cities became deserted ruins. Thousands, thousands of civilians died. Thousands of Ukrainian children were taken from their parents and deported to Russia to be adopted. In this war, Ukrainians are paying the highest price with their lives and their future. As you know, Sunflower of Peace was founded in, as you may know, Sunflower of Peace was founded in 2014 by Ukrainian woman Katya Malakhova, who lives in Boston area. The organization has been uh, providing medical supplies, supported orphanages, and disabled individuals since then. In addition, Sunflower of Peace has been supporting Ukrainian hospitals uh, with much needed uh, medical equipment and treatment. Since the full-scale invasion in, to, in February 2022, the mission of organization has changed. We are focusing 
on equipping medics and doctors to be able to save life of Ukrainian defenders injured in combat, also providing critical medical and humanitarian aid for Ukraine's most vulnerable civilian population and internally displaced. Sanflaro's peace uh, drastically expanded its tactical medicine operation and shipped thousands of paramedic backpacks filled with the critical medical supplies to the front lines of the war. During this year, we provided medical supplies and equipment, humanitarian aid, food, energy resources, winterization needs this winter. In addition, Sunflower of Peace developed, has developed a medical transportation program to equip Ukrainian medics with the ability to evacuate injured defenders to stabilization points and hospitals. We are fortunate to be surrounded by kind and generous people here who support Ukraine in many ways. We are at Sunflower of Peace, are grateful to everyone, and we are grateful to you for your donations today. It takes collect collective efforts of many nations to help Ukraine. We can do it together. Ukraine is a beautiful country, and we will fight to stop a war. We should not let the enemy destroy Ukraine. We can all defend it together. And thank you very much for your support today. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. To give, please follow the instructions printed in your order of worship or shown on the Zoom screen. For those in the meeting house, you also may deposit a check or cash in either of the collection plates at either door. And if you are proud of this church, become its advocate. If you care about its future, share its message that we welcome all to build a just and healthy world with faith, love, and compassion. Please super, support First Parish's social, social outreach by giving as generously as you can.
education. May these gifts be transformed into strength for this faith community, into comfort, food, and shelter for those in need. And may we be transformed by generosity. Please stay standing as you are able, and let's join our hearts in song. The hymn is number 153, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. of our chalice, let the flame of our faith burn bright within us. May we know our relational power and live it with the vision of peace, with the knowledge of care, and the wisdom of interdependence. We're all in this together. May we live it well. Amen. Have a good week.
Hey, Liz. Oh. oh. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, we, uh, if you want to 